Yeah. Um, a few familiar faces here, but a few unfamiliar ones. So just to kind of introduce myself, I'm Keith Rochford. Um, I joined the school last year and I joined the biosciences team. Uh, and my speciality is in cell culture and cell modeling. So to kind of give you an idea, like my research kind of operates on a much lower tier in terms of the tiers of life. I mean, the panel so far today, some really great talks and inspirational things operating at the higher tiers of life, looking at populations and humans, assessing the trends and kind of characteristics within them. But what I'm interested in is the lower tiers of life, like operating with the this most simple unit of life in the cell. You know, taking cells, exposing them to different environments or different conditions, and understanding how they respond to that. Because if we can understand that, we can understand how tissues respond, how systems respond, how the human responds, et cetera, et cetera, so that I can feed into you know, making adaptive changes in policies, in treatments, in diagnostics, and things like that. So my research career to date has looked at a number of different disease instances. And uh, like that, I'm very open-minded to all different disease states now. But like everyone in the last couple of years, I was fascinated by SARS-CoV-2, because this just blindsided us from nowhere. You know, We've lived with coronavirus for decades now, if not centuries. They've just naturally evolved alongside of us. But they've never really posed a problem until this guy came along. You know, they've, this one evolved in a certain way that now became a threat to us as a human species. And when it came on the scene at first, it was quickly categorized as a respiratory virus because the people or the populations that were presenting with infections were showing respiratory ailments. And this ranged from mild ones, such as colds and coughs and flu-like symptoms, to much more severe ones, such as ARDS, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or pneumonia, and in some cases proved fatal. As time kind of went on, um, we needed to kind of find an intervention here somewhere. We needed to kind of understand what this virus was doing, how it was causing these ailments, and basically find what interventions do we currently have or develop new ones to be able to tackle it because it was posing a, a significant problem as we're all well aware. And what scientists found after a time was that um, SARS-CoV-2 has this protein on its surface known as spike protein. And you might have seen microscopic images of coronavirus, but these spike proteins are what give it its crown-like shape. And that's where corona comes from, crown virus. And what spike protein does is it basically acts as an anchor that binds to this receptor that's found on cells known as ACE2, or angiotensin converting enzyme 2. This, led, like this, this had its advantages and disadvantages. In terms of advantages, it gave us an insight into how this virus actually invaded tissues. It gave us an explanation as to how when this virus entered our respiratory tract, how it was interacting with the different cells to cause, cause those destabilizations and things like that. But the disadvantage of it was is that we have ACE2 receptor throughout our body. So if that virus was able to migrate out of the lung and into the circulation, it would be able to travel to all the other different systems in the body, infect cells that also have this ACE2 receptor, and cause havoc there. And that's why SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus or COVID-19, whatever kind of way you recognize it as, that's why all these kind of other symptoms came from. Things like clots, things like reduced kidney function, reduced liver function, all these other kind of secondary symptoms that emerged, and in different populations depending on their background or lifestyle. Um, in this way, when we understood that ACE2 was the kind of primary target, and we, we kind of saw that ACE2 was expressed predominantly in the vascular system. And again, that explained the huge amounts to where all these secondary symptoms were coming from. So in the case of renal function, if you can imagine if SARS-CoV-2 can interact with the vascular cells of the kidney, that's causing a destabilization there, which is explaining why there's reduced kidney function. Same way if it interacts with the blood vessels in the liver, causes a destabilization, that's your reduced liver function, and so on and so forth. So basically, anything connected to the vascular system posed a potential problem or a potential disease state. So what about the brain? Like one of the most critical organs in the human body. That has vasculature too. It expresses ACE2, so what was going on there? The problem with when we were studying the brain with SARS-CoV-2 is if we want to look at liver function or if we want to look at kidney function, we can quickly assess that with a blood test. We can get populations people into the clinic, take blood samples, analyze them, and see if things are up or down. We can quickly come to some conclusions. <coughs> But with the brain, we rely on MRI, CAT scans, and things like that. Massive backlogs, reduced shortages in terms of getting people in and out. Plus, there's also demands on other people with other ailments to use these resources. So evidence, or I suppose data, on how SARS-CoV-2 interacted with the brain was a bit slower, a little bit shortcoming. But they had all the, the kind of symptoms or all the kind of characteristics that would allow destabilization and to cause havoc in the brain, too. So as I say, data was very, very slow coming out. But studies were undergoing, and what came out was some scary statistics in that some of the populations that managed to get scanned by MRI or CAT scans, in one study in particular, up to 40% of people, regardless of their age or gender or any kind of underlying lifestyle factors or anything like that, 
up to 40% of people presented with early stage characteristics that would increase their risk of stroke, increase their risk of hemorrhage, increased risk of encephalopathy. Regardless of age, there was people in their 20s and 30s who had gotten coronavirus, COVID-19, <coughs> and were now presenting with symptoms or aspects that would typically be in someone who's 50 or 60 years of age. So it's like an accelerated kind of disease symptom. But like that, we didn't know how it was interacting, we didn't really know how to combat it. So that's where like, I came in and my collaborators from UCD. We wanted to kind of study at the cellular level how coronavirus was actually interacting with the cells of the brain. And kind of just understand it a little bit more so that we could come up with therapeutic <coughs> interventions because the brain is shielded from the rest of the physiology in a much more different way. Okay, it's much more hard, much harder to access. There's basically a really tough filter here that basically blocks out a huge amount of medications from traveling to it. So we wanted to understand how did the virus actually gets the brain so that we could come up with interventions to stop it getting there. Kind of becoming with a preventative measure rather than having to come up with an intervention once it got in there. The kind of scary thing to kind of put in there is that some studies said that the pathway was it would start with an inhalation route, get into the lung, then traverse into the circulation, get pumped around, and then eventually reach the brain. So in this instance, it had to traverse all these different systems just to get to the brain, and it can come into contact with the immune system, comes into contact with all these different enzymes, all these different factors that could break it down and reduce its impact. But there's now a prevailing theory that in some cases, the virus can actually get in through the nose and go directly to the brain bypass all those systems. So this is kind of given a way to why there's such a diversity of the symptoms of the people who contract it. So we wanted, as part of our study, develop a model where we could look at what happens if we put the coronavirus on top of the vasculature, but also study if it was to interact it from underneath. Okay? So this is how we kind of study. We've looked at this in a number of different ways, but this is probably the most simple preliminary one that we went in with. So we actually modeled the broad-brain barrier by using this kind of semi-solid support, it's almost like a coffee filter or a, a sieve or a colander, we put in human microvascular endothelial cells, these are the cells that line all the blood vessels in the body, and then uh, this basically acts as our barrier, so we can expose it to different conditions, throw in a dye, and then track how quickly it crosses this barrier to see how strong a barrier that it is. So we were going to use this to throw in different amounts of coronavirus and just see how these cells respond to it, what's the barrier function like. In the first model where we actually threw the coronavirus in on top, so imagine that it's after going through the lung and it's after going through the circulation and then encountering these cells, we could see that in a dose-dependent manner and within six hours, that barrier started to break down, started to get more and more leaky. And when you've got that blood-brain barrier breaking down, it's not just about the virus getting in and out, but you lose that kind of dynamic regulation of all the resources, all the food, all the waste, everything like that. It can't function as well as it can in a healthy state. If we measured this up to 72 hours, it only got worse and worse. So we know people who've gotten coronavirus in its last <coughs> week or two. We know people who've suffered from long COVID. It's quite starting to think that if that virus is lingering around, what it's actually doing with the blood brain barrier if it gets in there. We also looked at it from what we call the uh, abluminal surface. So if it was to get in directly through the nose into the brain cavity itself, it's not as, as pronounced an effect, but at the higher concentrations, it does cause destabilization too. And even after 72 hours, that effect does go up. So regardless of how it gets in there, um, it can cause destabilization of that barrier, which could lead to consequences over the long term. Knowing that it destabilized, we were then interested in how it was actually destabilizing, and why was it that the barrier was getting leakier. So like that, there's only two ways that things can cross the blood-brain barrier. They can either go through the cell, which isn't very likely for something like coronavirus, because we've got a number of different metabolic receptors here that reject anything that they don't recognize. So if they don't naturally know coronavirus, they're just going to kick it back and not let it go through. But the other way is between cells. So if we know that it's getting leakier, we know that the coronavirus must be doing something to these proteins in the junctions, basically causing them to loosen, they are then causing that destabilization. So we then did like what we call a proteomic analysis in which we culture our cells with coronavirus. We then split them open to get all the proteins to spill out in what we call like a protein soup. And then we can use methodologies to be able to pick out our proteins of interest and quantify them, basically see how much of them are there. And we wanted to see in, in when they came into contact with coronavirus, perhaps they went up, perhaps they went down, perhaps there was no change. We were basically looking to characterize what was the coronavirus doing so that we could come up with an intervention towards that. And we threw the kitchen sink at it. We took some of the most prominent proteins that are found in that junction. And we were expecting maybe one or maybe two might go down, and that might explain why the barrier is failing. But in actual fact, the five most prominent ones in that junction, they all went down with respect to dose and time. We looked at it from beneath as well, again. 
exact same trend. So no matter where that virus got, whether it got in through the circulation, through the lung, and eventually arrived at the brain, or whether it got in through the nose and got to the brain that way, reduced expression of that junction. <coughs> So then we wanted to wonder, well, in terms of therapeutics or interventions, what do we do there? Because if we target something like ACE2, the body needs ACE2 to be able to function on a normal day-to-day -day life. So if we go in with medications that target that, that could cause secondary problems elsewhere in the body. If we go in with something like an antiviral medication, an antiviral medication doesn't only impact on virus, but also impacts on the cells in the surrounding area. So it works. <coughs> an antiviral is very, very effective if you inject it into the systemic circulation because the organs that it typically comes into contact with can regenerate in most instances, it can heal from it. But if you inject an antiviral into the brain and you have secondary effects, you're killing off neurons and things, they don't repair themselves. So that's also off the table. So what we wanted to do was figure out next, how was the coronavirus exerting its effect? Was it that coronavirus binds to the cells, causes that destabilization, and that's what causes the loosening? Or maybe the coronavirus interacts with the cells causes them to respond in a certain way that causes the destabilization. So is it a direct effect or is it an indirect effect? And one of the most interesting molecules that we found had an indirect <coughs> effect on our endothelium was one known as IL-6 or interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a cytokine that cells typically spit out as a kind of self-defense mechanism. So at the right <coughs> amount, IL-6 will actually recover or repair cells, but if there's too much of it, it'll work against the cell. So again, we kind of replicated our model we threw in our spike protein or our uh, coronavirus and we looked to measure how much IL-6 were the cells spinning out. And as we increased the amount of coronavirus they came into contact with, the concentration of IL-6 went up. So the cells were responding to this in a way that said, right, there's something not right here, we're going to produce IL-6 to try and protect ourselves. And again, we saw expression in the cell as well, so we looked at the proteome and saw it go up. What we did next was we went in with an intervention to block out IL-6. Because if we can knock out IL-6 and do the exact same thing, if the damage goes up, it's having a protective effect. If damage goes down, it's having a, a damaging effect. We're basically looking to see where was the IL-6 concentration that was the pivot point. So going in with just a common IL-6 uh, therapy, you can see here this is our barrier function. You can see this is how normal cells respond. When we put in coronavirus, the amount of dye that goes through the layer that goes up, so that's causing a weakening in the barrier. When we go with an IL-6 medication, the damage goes down. So that suggests that IL-6 isn't having a protective effect, that the cells are actually damaging themselves in response to the virus. Similarly, if we go in with that IL-6 medication, we can actually restore the proteins in the junction. So we're stopping that loosening between them and causing them to become restabilized again. So again, this is kind of using an existing medication that's out there, commonly prescribed for rheumatoid arthritis, but could have a preventative measure of potential five minutes. I'm really, I'm really there, <laughs> so yeah, um, just to kind of say, you might be saying to yourself, okay, that cells in a dish, and you know, we were throwing coronavirus in, like what implications that have on the greater level? Like that within our network, our research network, what we're doing is we're like interacting with clinicians, we're using animal studies and all to kind of see what the translational benefits of this are. But um, in this case, we do have an apparatus in the lab where we can basically build a human blood vessel without actually using a human. So we can incorporate all the different cells that comprise the blood-brain barrier, we can introduce blood flow. We can basically trick the cells into thinking that they're part of a blood vessel without having to use an actual <coughs> blood vessel. So it's as close as we can get to a clinical trial without using a human. And what we found is, again, if we go in with our IL-6 therapy, we can actually cause a restabilization of that barrier. So it does seem to have potential therapeutic application. And we're moving into different trials and different kind of studies now to kind of reconfirm that, but it is looking really promising. And this is just one candidate that we've looked at. We've looked at a number of different medications or anti-inflammatories too to see if they might have a preventative or an interventive um, application in this setting. But it's only gonna get worse, like as new strains come on stream and all, we're going to need something that's gonna be, you know, be able to be prescribed to kind of cope with different populations that might be vulnerable in certain states. So just to kind of wrap it up, um, coronavirus spike protein in particular, it reduces vascular barrier in a concentration of time dependent manner. And it does this by influencing the expression of the proteins, which comprise paracellular joints, so basically the gaps between the cells and where they join. And these effects are driven in this study by uh, IL-6 release associated with uh, coronavirus infection. So it kind of highlights the therapeutic potential of strategies of targets such in this context. So I know we'll probably leave questions to the end, but thanks very much for your attention. Hopefully that was okay. <laughs>